All right. Well, thank you to everyone who's coming, who's come in and who's coming on. Um, my name is Amy Nykamp. I'm the president of the Sonoma County Now chapter, and we are very excited to be able to hear from Rosita Stevens Holsey, who, as you have heard from our promotions, is the niece of, or one of the nieces, of the uh, Reverend Dr. Polly Murray, who was uh, not only a wonderful human being and a lifelong activist, but she was um, the first uh, African-American Episcopal priest. She co-founded, along with about 30 others, the um, original National Organization for Women. She was a lawyer, um, and she did so much more that I'll, I'll let Rosita actually tell you about that. Um, but Rosita herself has done a great deal in her life. Um, among things, uh, the last several years, she's been writing this book on her aunt. And um, she taught for some 14 years in um, Prince George's County Public Schools um, and taught all the subjects, kindergarten through fourth grade, and, and did a lot of STEM um, subjects and she was director of operations for um, the ARC of DC, which is now known as My Own Place, Inc. Um, she's, she worked for that for, for a number of years. She's been a director for other um, community services, in, including the uh, Associated Catholic Charities and um, the director of the Chamber of Commerce, if I read your resume correctly, Rosita, correct me if I'm wrong. She's won all sorts of awards, um, including the um, Black Businesswoman of the Year, Outstanding Minority Business of the Year, Outstanding Educator of the Year. Um, she's gotten uh, the um, Polly Murray Center is up and running for the last 10 years, and she's a board member on that, among other things. And, and um, the Polly Murray Center, I put, if you're just joining, you probably haven't seen it, so I'll have to put it in again, but the links to the Polly Murray Center and also um, Rosita's website herself, which is preserving partpollymurray.com. Uh, but I'll, I'll put those back in the chat for everyone who's, st who's still coming in. Um, I want to also introduce Elaine Holtz, who is our past president and who is representing in, in a lot of ways the reason that we're here tonight. She's got a radio show on um, KBBF um, radio, and I'll let her talk about that in her show. Uh, can, we op can we open it up to the gallery? Um, it is in gallery. It is. Oh, yes. was it? it doesn't work. I guess it's not working on my on my machine. Well, I want to welcome everybody, and I just want everybody to know I am so excited about this evening, and to see so many of you people here joining. Uh, to me, the way I look at this presentation that uh, that Rosita is going to do for me, it's the closest I've ever been to history. That's how I feel when I listen to her when she talks about her her aunt when she expresses what she went through and who she was as a person. And in reading Polly Murray, in reading Polly Murray's book, it has given me more confidence to speak out, to be who I am and to recognize how important it is as women that we support one another and we look at each other's identities and accept who we are as who we are. It's so important. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. And I want to thank Rosita from the bottom of my heart for agreeing to come and to speak to us here in Sonoma County. It is such an honor to have her here. And thank you all for being here. So Rosita, you're on. Thank you. And I am so pleased to be here. Elaine invited me to be on her radio show. Um, and this is really how I uh, found my way to this um, evening's presentation, Elaine and I talked uh, for about an hour recently, and then she suggested uh, that now include me. Um, I'm very honored 
to be uh, a part of the Maury family. I've tried to think of what I should present to you this evening, and hopefully some of you have heard about Polly Murray and know things. So I thought I would give you little tidbits of a variety of her background in hopes that it would uh, inspire you to read more. Um, there have been uh, three books that she wrote, um, her biography, a biography of our family, uh, which came out in the 50s before Root, uh, Roots. We um, very proud of that. It includes a history of the conditions of Black people in the United States at that time. And she had to um, spend a couple of years researching at the National Archives because, of course, there wasn't uh, the internet and computers at that time. So she went through all the books and records looking for, <clears throat> excuse me, information about the Murrays and the Fitzgeralds and the people who preceded them. So let me share um, a backstory and how I'm related to her. Uh, my Aunt Polly had uh, five siblings. They were all born in their family home in Baltimore, Maryland. And unfortunately, when uh, Aunt Polly was three years old, their mother died. Uh, after Aunt Polly was born, uh, she was sent to Durham, North Carolina to live with her namesake, Aunt Pauline, um, because their mother was carrying my mother. And after my mother was born, very close after that, she um, had a son. And as a result, probably of having six children so closely together, it was um, too much for her. And she had an aneurysm and she died very young. Uh, since Aunt Polly had lived with Aunt Pauline for about nine months, after they tried to determine what to do with the five children, Aunt Polly was asked, would she like to stay with her siblings or go back to Durham with her namesake aunt? And believe it or not, as a three-year-old, she knew exactly what she wanted to do. And she said she wanted to go back and live with Aunt Pauline. And so she did. And the reason I'm sharing that is because I really think uh, her experience living with Aunt Pauline and her experience living in what we call the Jim Crow South was really what uh, helped form who she became and actually made her so different than my mother and her other brothers and sisters. Uh, those five who were left in Baltimore lived um, an upper class or middle class existence and um, they really didn't need anything else than they were given it, you know, through their family. And they had a, a pretty charmed life. When Aunt Polly went to um, Durham, not that Durham or the South was the only place there was discrimination, but uh, she was exposed to uh, much more discrimination uh, on a daily basis than my mother and the other siblings experienced. Uh, <clears throat> There are five cousins, uh, first cousins, uh, that are still alive. I am the middle niece. So there are three nieces and two nephews. Um, my oldest cousin, who's 89, is legally blind. So I sort of picked up the torch to become the matriarch of the family a little early um, because she is not able to um, carry on what I call the legacy or to assist in carrying on um, the legacy. Uh, my mother Rosetta was Aunt Polly's youngest sister. And as I mentioned before, 
Uh, Polly went back to Durham and stayed with her grandparents and two aunts. Now, she really didn't play with a lot of children. She lived in a home with an elderly um, grandmother and grandfather and uh, her two, at the time, maiden aunts. Uh, there were no children's books in the house. So she read books about um, things that adults would. She read uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. She read um, things about Booker T. Washington or any books that they had in the home. Um, this, of course, didn't start exactly when she was three, but because there was no one who could uh, care for her during the day, and the grandparents weren't really uh, up to having um, her stay at home, she went to school with her Aunt Pauline. And it just so happened that her Aunt Pauline was a first grade teacher. So every day she's sitting in the room, she wasn't allowed to interact with the children or participate in the lessons, but literally all day long while they were in school, she sat and listened to whatever they were doing. And finally, one day she said to her Aunt Pauline, um, can I read? And Aunt Pauline said, read what? She said, can I read what the students are reading? So she said, well, you can't read. And she said, yes, I can. And uh, she got the book and she read everything. And Aunt Pauline was perplexed and puzzled. And uh, afterwards she said, I'm gonna really see if she can read because she's heard that so often in the classroom. She's probably memorized that. So she gave her a book that Aunt Polly had never seen. And Aunt Polly read the whole book. So she was uh, amazed uh, by that, but it really showed, um, and I think was a forethought to what Aunt Polly could become and, and would become because she was um, very uh, audacious. She was a brilliant person. Um, she was kind of quirky and she didn't like to be challenged. So if she was given a challenge, she was determined to take it on. Um, my relationship with Aunt Polly started um, in the forties when, when of course I was born. Uh, she was um, at Howard and um, my family moved back to Washington. Uh, I always say when people ask me, well, did I really know her? Have I met her? You know, have I spent any time with her? I say our lives intersected for 43 years. So those were the years between the time when um, I was born and she died. And though we lived often um, miles apart and sometimes uh, oceans apart, um, we became very close. I think that uh, I get my strong will and determination, perseverance and sense of independence uh, from her. She was very daring and there were very few things that she was not uh, willing to try, whether it was an adventure or something she had never tried. Uh, those of you who may have read something about her know that she rode across the United States um, in freight cars and she would have to, like the hobos, um, you know, jump on the train after, they would hide until the train got started and then they would have to run and grab the ladder to try to get on the train. And then while they were on the freight trains, they would um, have to hide because there were security people and police and uh, staff on the trains who you know, were looking for uh, people who were getting a free ride. So she, she didn't have any fear of doing those kinds of things. 
It also was a precursor to her um, not uh, having a fear to approach people, to uh, speak her mind, um, to make sure people knew when she felt uh, they were doing something wrong or saying something wrong. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, was a teacher for the last 14 years. I just retired um, this year, the end of the school year. And um, I had always thought of writing uh, children's books and I actually had written a children's book, but I never uh, presented it to a publisher. But once I realized that there was an interest in Polly Murray, um, I kept thinking in my mind, I wonder if I could write a book about my aunt. Because even though I spent time with her, I actually lived in her apartment. Um, I went on uh, trips with her. And um, we, we always said that DC was um, a place she could always come. And she had to come to DC, of course, for Howard, uh, for government um, meetings, and, and usually to get, go south. We were her DC headquarters. So she never had to stay in a hotel or you know eat in a restaurant if she didn't want to. She could just come uh, to her DC home and she would have two of her sisters, uh, Mildred and uh, Rosetta. So I would like to um, share with you a little bit of her journey as I uh, included in um, the book. Uh, first of all, I was very, very lucky that one day when I was at Howard University, um, at a play about Aunt Polly, in fact, um, there was a lady who was looking for a relative to talk to. And uh, the university had blocked off the first two aisles in the auditorium for uh, Murray relatives. So when the, this lady turned out to be uh, Terry Katasus Jennings, and so she just came up and said, okay, who's a relative of Polly Murray? And everybody turned around and pointed to me. And she said, um, I just love your aunt. I learned about your aunt when I was writing about some activists. And I wrote about six activists for the Methodist church. And, but your aunt was the one that really touched my heart. And she said, I, I want to write a book about her, but I want to write it with someone who really knew her and would give the book heart was the way she put it. And so I said, well, I want to write a book about her too. So we agreed to meet. And that's how it all began in about 1917. Uh, she came to visit me at my home and we talked all day. And then I went to her home for a weekend and we sort of laid out the foundation of how we thought, uh, you know, what the book should uh, contain and how could it be different than some of the other books that were on the market or we anticipated would be um, written. And then she has a home on the Rat uh, Rappahannock River in Virginia. So we went down there and that became our writing colony. And we spent eight days from morn till dusk <clears throat> before we had our wine hour. And uh, we just wrote and wrote and wrote. And uh, I also um, didn't like doing a lot of the tedious um, footnoting and all that I'd had to do in college. So I suggested I would get oral histories from my relatives and other people that uh, had actually known her and was, was still alive. So that's a little um, background of, of how the two of us came together and um, created the book, uh, which sat on the shelf of our agent for about a year. 
because we couldn't get anybody interested in Polly Murray at the time. But um, there was a real shift in interest after George Floyd's death. And after George Floyd's death, um, I think publishers were looking for other things. And so luckily uh, they came across the book sitting on the shelf and we were offered um, a contract and that's how that all uh, started. Um, when Polly Murray uh, came to Durham and lived, she found out right away that uh, a lot of things she called unfair uh, were happening. She didn't understand why um, she couldn't go in certain restaurants. She didn't understand why she had to go to the back of the bus. She didn't understand why, um, as, a, as we were called then, colored or Negroes had to um, uh, go to school at dilapidated buildings and use uh, books that uh, had been hand-me-down from uh, students in the white schools. Uh, so she really, as a very young child, understood what being fair and not being fair was. And she talked about it, uh, even to the fact that when she was three years old and had just moved to Durham, she told her Aunt Pauline she was upset because uh, the grandfather got three pancakes and she only got one. And she said she was hungry and obviously he was hungry, but if it were fair, they all would have gotten the same amount of pancakes. So that kind of attitude and that kind of perception uh, grew with her throughout uh, her life. And she was always interested in not only that she was treated fairly, but she grew up believing that any human being was equal to another human being and that we were all one race, the human race. And that was the world that she created within herself. And she um, grew up to really uh, want to do uh, and to be a part of. Um, a lot of times I'm asked by people when I meet them, um, what about Pauli Murray um, inspired me? And uh, why did I decide to um, want to talk about her, want to share her life with people and um, get involved with the Pauli Murray Center and the National uh, Women's History Alliance, which um, is another board I'm on because that organization wants to make sure that women are written into history or written back into history. And I'll share with you a little backstory on that. Um, about 19, about 2015, um, you know, a relative might call me and say, um, have you heard about something going on at Duke about Aunt Polly, and I'd say, no, nobody's called me. And um, all of the brothers and sisters, the six brothers and six sisters had died by um, 1992. And so there were none of them left. And so every once in a while I would get a call or see a relative and they kept saying, well, something's going on. So my niece decided to go to Durham and find out what this was all about. And she took her son, who was an adult at the time, and they came back and they told me they had been to the center. They had met Barbara Lau, the executive director, who had actually saved our ancestral home, which was built in 1898. That's the actual house. <clears throat> Polly lived in from three years old until she finished um, high school. And uh, then Barbara and the group from Duke 
was uh, fundraising and <clears throat> trying to make the um, leg the legacy of Polly Murray more well known. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they promised the next year that um, I would come down. So when I came down, I met Barbara. I went to what will become the Pauli Murray Center for History and Social Justice. I went to do, and uh, I met a lot of people who, for some reason, uh, were doing all of this volunteer work for a woman that they had never met. And um, because she was declared a saint, uh, in the Episcopal Church. She is honored every July 1st or during the first week of July by the Episcopal Church. And it just so happened we came down the first week and we went to um, a service at Titus uh, Episcopal Church. I've now found out that that was actually a church that her Aunt Pauline and Aunt Sally were um, founders of. So that church is over a hundred years old and it is still there. It's still tiny and they celebrate uh, Pauli Murray every January. So I was just amazed um, at the service, the people who had come from out of town to talk about her, um, the people who were all there just to honor her. And at the end of their feast, they always have their ice cream social, which is like a half an hour and they, you know, you get ice cream and shake hands and what have you. So about an hour and a half late, later, we're, my niece and I are still standing in line waiting to talk to these, uh, to the attendees who were determined to come and talk to us before they left the church. And some some people had met her. They wanted to share their tidbits about that. Uh, some people had only read about her, but they wanted to let us know um, what they thought about what they had learned. And, <clears throat> and some people, of course, had, uh, were in the church and so knew, knew a little bit more about her. But I actually had an epiphany and an out of body experience because people would just come up to me and say, can I touch your hand? You know, they would give me their hand to shake and then they wouldn't let it go. And they would just say, you know, you have the same blood she has. Um, I just wanted to touch you. I just wanted to be able to say I had met a relative. And when I left there that night, you know, I got back to the hotel and I said to my niece, you know, none of the family is doing anything like this. And we need to find out what is going on because obviously there are people who've been touched by her and who wanna celebrate her. And I decided that, that night in that church that it was not only an honor to be her niece, but it was a responsibility of mine to do something to promote her, to enhance her legacy, or to um, make sure that especially children uh, knew more about her because um, I was so inspired by what other people were telling me about my aunt the same person I had known all those years, but had never known uh, all of the things that she had done and the impact that she had made on people's lives. And I guess more importantly, the impact that she really made on the legal system. Um, those of us who are probably here now uh, may know of some of that, but there are so many, especially uh, black and brown people, indigenous people uh, who have made such an impact on building this country 
but are not celebrated and are really unsung heroes. So um, I really applauded what the National um, Women's History Alliance is doing in terms of enhancing uh, women's legacy. And of course, the Pauli Murray Center uh, in enhancing on Pauli's legacy. And I just decided that that's where I thought I should spend my time. So having, uh, you know, after I met Terry and uh, after I thought this through, I decided that um, I would retire from teaching and uh, dedicate myself to promoting um, her and other women uh, who have been left out of history. Um, because of Jim Crow, uh, Aunt Pauli decided that she wanted to go to college and under no circumstances would she stay in the South. Um, her vision of the North was that there was no Jim Crow and everything was like peaches and cream. So she decided to go to New York and she had picked Columbia University, but she did not know that Columbia uh, did not take women. So she got to New York and, and she had no idea the cost of uh, going to such a school, but she was first in her class at Hillside High in Durham. And she thought that that, you know, gave her some heads up in the area. She found out that if she wasn't a New York resident, she probably couldn't afford to go to any college. So one of um, her cousins who lived in Queens uh, adopted her at 17 and she was able to um, uh, apply to go to college. <clears throat> she found out that the Southern education that a Black person got was not adequate to um, make her qualified to go to college. And they said she would at least need another year of high school. So on my, um, her, the aunt agreed that she, Aunt Maud agreed that she would, um, Cousin Maud, that she could stay with her for a year and finish school. Well, after they looked at um, her transcript, they told her, actually, um, you can't come in a year, you don't have enough credits. And in Durham and in the South, um, usually black children uh, did not go to 12 grades. And in some states, like my husband was from Mississippi, uh, after the sixth grade, a lot of black children could not go to uh, the rest of school because they would have to pay to go to a private school. They weren't often allowed to go to public schools. And um, Aunt Pauli had gone to the 11th grade in Durham at the time when she graduated, um, colored uh, schools went to the 11th grade. So they told her, you actually need two years. Well, Aunt Pauli said, this will not do. So she said, if I go to the classes for one year and pass them, and if I study for the other year and pass the region, because New York is very strict and has a very different program where uh, years and years ago, back obviously early 1900s, uh, to finish high school, you had to pass these regions. So she actually went to school in Queens for one year, but did two years worth of high school, passed all of the tests and qualified to go to college. And then she entered Hunter College where she found out she was not as prepared as she thought she was because most of the other students, there were 4,000 uh, students there and only four were black. And uh, she said it was really rigorous, uh, but 
she worked very hard and she finished uh, college and, you know, she uh, had some up and down and she really, uh, when she went to college, was going to school because she wanted to be a poet and a writer. And she was told immediately, you don't have what it takes to be a poet or a writer nor will you be able to make a living as a poet or a writer. So she was not encouraged by 99% uh, of her uh, professors, but there was one professor that assisted her and, and motivated her and uh, helped her to uh, try to guide her and inspire her. And she also had a student there who um, had had a better education than she. And so between this, that professor and the student, um, she was able to uh, finish school, but she had no thought about uh, being a writer uh, because she'd been so discouraged. And unfortunately, when she graduated, it was in the throes of the Great Depression. So not only could she not get a decent job, but people who had decent jobs lost their jobs. They lost their homes. They, um, it was a bad time for everybody. And eventually um, she, uh, she had all kind of little jobs like the, a switchboard operator or a waiter or uh, sometimes clerical work, but not really jobs that could uh, uh, she could survive on. So um, her uh, one of the things she did was uh, get married uh, because she thought two could live cheaper than one. And uh, she realized she'd made a mistake there. She didn't love the gentleman she married and that didn't last. Um, and so she really had to uh, live um, frugally, but she was sent or was able to go to one of the camps that Mrs. Roosevelt had uh, set up for people who were unemployed, for women who um, were either homeless, unemployed, underemployed, or what have you. And that was really her first foray into um, seeing Mrs. Roosevelt uh, for the first time, who at the time was the first lady. But she didn't last very long at that uh, camp. And um, Calling for help. she didn't... Um, last very long at any job, but not so much because she couldn't do it just the times. And so she sort of bounced around uh, from time to time. And um, eventually she uh, got a job during um, Hello. labor Hello. organizing. Hello. And- Sorry. I didn't understand it. Connecting you to a care specialist to get help. Is that a coming from? Okay. So she um, she uh, later on was working as a labor organizer when uh, she met a professor from Howard University. No, I'm sorry, no. No, need to apologize. I just want to confirm you do not need help, correct? No, thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad to hear everything is okay. Thank you for choosing Medical Guardian. Just know we're here for you whenever you need and we're spreading your device. Take care. Thank you. I'm sorry, that was my <laughs> alert watch. I must have touched it. And um, it sent a signal to Atlanta that I needed help. But um, so she was given the opportunity uh, through uh, observation of her work um, in, in helping sharecroppers um, 
to uh, go to Howard University to law school. And she had never really thought about that. But in reviewing what had gone on in her life up to that point, she realized that if she wanted to change the discrimination, the Jim Crow things that she saw, um, having to ride on the back of the bus, not being able to go to certain restaurants, you know, sit sit where she wanted to sit in the movies and things of that nature, maybe going to law school would be a good uh, thing. So she went to law school. She had uh, the scholarship, but she didn't have a place to live. She didn't have money for food. She didn't have money for uh, books. Um, so again, she was being challenged, but we had a cousin who was Dean of Women at Howard at the time, coincidentally, and she found a place for her to live in the basement of a building uh, on, on campus and um, just with a little cot and like a hot plate and what have you. And that's how she lived all through law school. But she was so excited to be there because she thought, I'm here with my people. I'm here with uh, a prestigious law school and things will be much better. She had no idea that she would spend three years in law school with all men uh, because the other woman who uh, was in her class dropped out early and just be um, almost ignored and laughed at because she was a woman. Um, even her professors made fun of her, uh, even the professor that offered her the scholarship and got her the scholarship because they said, well, what kind of job are you gonna get? You know, no woman, no black woman is gonna get a job and can live as a lawyer. Um, but again, if you told her she couldn't do something, her idea was, I'll show them. So she went there day in and day out and her goal was, I'll be better than all of you. And by the second year, she was a top student in the class and the only female. And the um, uh, top student in the class was automatically the judge of the court of peers. And they just would not have it that this woman was going to be the judge. And so they had no judge that year for the court because they weren't gonna let her do it. And then the uh, last year of law school, the third year of law school, she was a top student as well. So they gave in and they let her take on the role that she was supposed to have. And um, even though they sort of poo-pooed and uh, not really was serious about some of the kind of legal theories, um, that she came up with. What they didn't realize was she was so ahead of her time in terms of being a legal theorist that she was predicting what should happen or what would happen. Um, when she finished law school or in order to finish law school, every student had to write, I guess what you would call a thesis. And so she was um, determined that the um, thesis she wrote would be about something that she had talked about in class and the boys and the teachers had uh, uh, really chuckled at. And that was about the clause um, about separate but equal. She thought that they were never gonna solve the problem of how uh, Negroes or colored people were treated if they went one hospital at a time and said at this particular case, uh, someone was in a car accident, they go to the black hospital as they were required to go. And that hospital may not have been able to save their life because they didn't have 
the doctors, the equipment, the knowledge that the hospital for white people had. But they were taking each individual incident and uh, going before the courts to try to uh, prove that um, separate but equal was not really equal. And her theory was, no, you, you have to reverse that. That is not uh, that is not equal protection under the law. So this is what she wrote her paper on. Uh, she turned it in, she got her A in that class. Um, Spotswood Robinson put the paper in the drawer of his desk and off she went um, to uh, try to get her master's in law. Now, there was, uh, I don't know if it was an unwritten rule or written rule, but there was a policy that the top Black student at Howard, which was the premier Black law school, would automatically be given a scholarship to go to Harvard Law School to get their master's. So, of course, Aunt Polly said, I'm the top student. So she fills out the application, sends in all her work, but you have to send a picture in. So they knew right away or felt right away she was not a male. So uh, they contacted her and they said she could not be admitted, um, not because she was colored or Negro, but because she was a female. So she had hit another brick wall and another reality. You know, it's bad enough not to be the white the race that will get uh, be treated fairly, but now it's my gender. And she was determined by that time, she was friends with um, Eleanor Roosevelt and President Roosevelt uh, had graduated from Harvard. And he actually wrote a letter to the Dean of the law school asking for her to be committed, uh, admitted. And they said, no, we don't accept females. So she wasn't able to, to go. And then she decided to go to uh, the University of North Carolina where um, the, uh, our white ancestors had donated a lot of money um, to the university. And uh, again, she was not admitted because she wasn't white. So she was continuously hitting these uh, brick walls, but she decided to, um, she want, didn't want to go to uh, a school for colored children, uh, students. So she was able to get in at the University of California, Berkeley. And that's where she uh, received her master's. Um, and she had some problems there in terms of housing and what have you. She thought California was the Mecca and she was, you know, the, the progressives and what have you. But she uh, did go out there and uh, was able to finish school and uh, was actually given a job as the first deputy, um, not the first deputy um, Attorney General, but the first black female deputy attorney general of California after she graduated. But um, she became ill and uh, the person who had had the job before her came back from the war. So that was a sort of short lived um, uh, job, but she uh, actually had qualified for it and passed the California bar. So she uh, soon after headed toward New York and uh, passed the New York bar. So she was in New York a while and uh, worked for a big prestigious law firm, but she didn't like what they had her working on. She wanted to work on human rights and civil rights and not uh, what she was assigned to. So in her typical fashion, if she didn't like what was going on, she moved on and found something, you know, that she um, might like better. So this was, um, 
how she um, worked throughout her life during that time. Of course, she, um, or after that time, she went to Ghana and uh, helped them write their constitution and taught uh, in their law school. Um, she didn't last there too long because she was too progressive and the climate of the government was changing. So she was uh, there a little less than a couple of years, but it was suggested to her to um, not hang around with the change in the government. But while she was in Ghana, she met someone from Yale and that's how um, she got the idea that she would go to Yale and get uh, a doctorate of law, which she did. Um, and as you may know, she was the first African-American male or female to get a doctorate of law from um, Yale. So here was a woman with all of these uh, degrees in education and intelligence and experience. And she really, because of the times, um, could not really get a, a, law, a, a decent job or sustain herself uh, in the field of law. And even when she was at Howard, uh, Carolyn Ware, who became a lifelong friend, who happened to be white and happened to have been uh, a graduate of a law school, couldn't get a job. Uh, as a lawyer, so she was teaching at um, Howard. And when Aunt Pauly was working for Paul Rifkin, uh, the law firm, um, there's a story that's been verified that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg came there in hopes of getting a job. Um, and she was told by one of the partners that um, she didn't have a, a chance to get a job there because they had a twofer. They had a female who was Black or African-American and a female. So they decided that they had met their quota and they didn't have to have a, another one. Um, probably later on, they were pretty sorry that they... Um, I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg came back later and was actually able to work there, but um, but she didn't get that job at that particular time when Aunt um, Polly was there. Uh, she um, found out, I think, uh, before she left Howard, she had bet her college professor that the uh, Supreme Court case Plessy uh, versus Ferguson would be overturned, which was one of the theories around um, uh, equal protection under the law and separate but equal. And of course, everyone had laughed and what have you. And she said, I bet you $10 uh, in 25 years, it'll be overturned. And 10 years later, uh, Plessy versus um, Ferguson was overturned. And uh, she happened to see uh, Sp Spotswood Robinson and she got her $10, $10 back, but no one told her Thur Thurgood Marshall, um, uh, one of the professors, uh, Ransom and Robinson, all of whom she knew, never told her that it was her law school thesis that became the core of their argument before the Supreme Court, the famous Brown versus the Board of Education, because uh, uh, Spotswood Robinson remembered that paper she had written and presented it to Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP. NAACP, and that is what they used, um, but nobody told her at the time. So it was actually after she won the bet uh, that she found out that um, they had used her work and her theory that had been so funny to the men 
in her class. Um, on the other hand, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg used uh, some of her work and uh, she and uh, attorney uh, Keaton, and she put on Pauli's name and uh, the other female lawyer on the brief that went before the Supreme Court. So that was the first time that she had actually gotten uh, credit for her ideas. Um, so I always think that um, had it been a different time, had she been born a little later, uh, she probably um, would have had more opportunities in the legal field and really made an impact or really not been invisible uh, during her uh, lifetime. Uh, but the um, work that she did, the theories that she had are uh, more documented now. And uh, like some other people, um, from marginalized communities, they are being uh, included in, in history and hopefully more will be um, as well. She um, worked at many jobs. I always thought she was a nomad and I love to travel and uh, visit other cultures, no other uh, people and I lived overseas for 10 years and I never realized that a lot of her travels was because she um, you know circumstances where she couldn't really get a good job and so she would go to another job and and so she really um, didn't have a lot of uh, long-term uh, jobs also because she was really uh, short of money most of the time or not really living the kind of life she should with the education and experiences she'd had. Um, she often was malnourished and uh, her health wasn't good. So um, that was, you know, very unfortunate. Um, but as she grew older, um, she, she uh, lost a loved one uh, when she was in her 70s. And she decided that she wanted to give her life to God. And uh, she decided to um, study for the priesthood. A lot of people ask me, well, why would she want to be an Episcopal priest? Didn't she know she couldn't become a priest because they didn't allow it? And when did she become interested in the Episcopal church? Well, she was born an Episcopalian. She was baptized an Episcopalian in Baltimore at St. James Church when she was uh, less than a year old. And in uh, Durham, uh, they went to church every Sunday. So she was, uh, she grew up in the Episcopal Church and she had always been an Episcopalian, but um, she felt she needed to, uh, I think, find happiness and um, change what she had done. And she was so heartbroken over uh, the loss of the love of her life. And so she did join um, or get admitted to a seminary to study to be a priest. But when she graduated, women still couldn't be priests. So in typical Pauli Murray fashion, she found other women who wanted to move up in the church from lay positions and, and um, uh, positions where they obviously couldn't be a priest. So they began to protest and even have uh, ceremonies as though they were becoming priests. So by a couple of years after she finished the seminary, they did uh, admit the first group of women 
And she, uh, I think there were seven, six or seven women in that group that were ordained. And uh, she was the only African-American woman. And so that's why she became the first African-American female to become a priest. And uh, she, she was <laughs> up in age and they actually have um, a term where you have to retire regardless of your health or anything as a, uh, from the priesthood. So she was able to serve for, I think about seven years before mandatory, mandatory retirement. And uh, she was able to write. Um, she had her book of, uh, with a book of poetry they put together after her death. And uh, she died just before she finished her autobiography song in a weary throat but that was finished by her professor and friend Carolyn Ware and that that was published after she died and of course she had written Proud Shoes the story of our ancestors um, so I'm thrilled that she lived a um, worthwhile life that she was um, instrumental in so many things that we benefit by, even though most people don't know that. And I will continue to um, be honored that I'm a part of her family. And I think that if she knew what my niece and I, my niece Rhea and I, are doing to uplift her legacy, she would just shake her head and because she uh, would wonder what is all this fuss going on about her uh, and why are you working so hard? But I think that if she kept all those records and all those tapes and all those speeches, even though she always was a writer and kept journals all her life and she donated them to the Schlesinger Library. I think she wanted us to know, you know, what she had done and no better way to share that with the world than to share it in your own voice or your own hand or as um, she's known for typing on the typewriter. Um, I didn't know how much time we had. I had just, uh, um, if you need me to stop, I will. I had just gone to the, the chapter about the National Organization for Women. So I thought if you had time, I might share some of that. But if not, I'll just share with you that um, in the book, uh, there is a chapter uh, about the organization. Um, she was um, a fierce advocate for women, uh, for minorities, um, and as she said, for humans. She just believed that we all should have the same rights. And I think she would be horrified at some of the things that are happening now and have been happening uh, most recently. Um, but I try to take inspiration from her life story uh, and hope that I can inspire children as well as adults to not let um, this country continue the way that uh, it seems to be going now and to never get up, give up, to always fight for what you think is right and uh, frankly, to mobilize. So as long as I'm here on this earth, I, I want to um, work toward that goal. And again, I'm so pleased that um, you allowed me to be a part of your regular monthly meeting. And uh, so happy that I met Elaine and that I've met other people who um, have been inspired 
by someone in my family. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, I have just allowed you to unmute yourselves. So if you want to give a big round of applause through. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Rosita. This was, we learned so much. <laughs> So I do have a, a question regarding now, um, what was it about the National Organization for Women that caused, what, what did we do as an organization that caused um, the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray to back away from and leave the membership? And, what, and do you think she'd rejoin it now? Oh yeah, I do think that uh, she would probably rejoin it now. She might have some suggestions here and there, uh, but no, I, I do think she would be um, uh, in line with what she would see now that it's developed into. But at the time she was extremely interested in women having the same rights as men. And when they were expanding on rights, with um, amendments and uh, new laws and uh, constitutional changes and what have you. She uh, said, you can't just include black men, you have to include women. And uh, as you probably know, uh, she and, and some heavy hitting women were working on the uh, commission the president's commission on the status of women. And so at the uh, gathering when they were uh, working, they came up with the idea, put in their $5 and formed what became the National Organization for Women. So she was uh, very supportive of it at the time, but after a while she felt that the core values of the organization were not really embracing black women that um, as a part of it. And uh, her theory is always, if I don't see something happening the way I think it should happen, uh, I'll go start another organization to do what I think needs to be done or find another organization that's doing what I think is necessary. So she did become disenchanted, not so much with the work, how they were doing it, who the people were, but just she didn't see enough um, go embracing of uh, the black race. And she did the same thing with the NAACP. She was just uh, horrified that um, the men from the NAACP and the, uh, uh, Martin Luther King and the others uh, had that march on Washington and they didn't even let Rosa Park walk with the men or be on the podium. Uh, it was like, how dare you? And so she was quite um, uh, upset by that and, and and really uh, moved moved away from that organization as well. Uh, there's a story that um, she <laughs> she was so proud of the fact that at some point when she had moved north, when she had moved to New York, uh, the New York Times was writing Negro in the newspaper with a capital N as opposed to the way it had always been in the South with a small N. And so she was very proud of that. You know, she felt that uh, gave it status like if you were uh, Finnish or Dutch. And um, so when there was an evolution and there was a changing of names, unfortunately what often happens is the people who make changes aren't really the people who need the changes made. Or I remember when affirmative action became, you know, something that was supposed to be a high priority. It was not always um, 
bringing in the people who felt they were being discriminated against and having them at the table that helped make the changes. It was the, you know, the regular power structure. So that's the way that she saw things. And she was uh, offered to um, participate in some things when arbitrarily people were changed our name to African-Americans, which was not something uh, Negroes had decided. And so she said, no, if, if you're gonna call me an African-American, no, uh, because she was so stuck on Negro with the capital N. And so she would not participate, which was a, you know, a very important opportunity. So she was, she was very stubborn. Um, but the good part was she really, the things that she really believed in, she would work for 24 seven. And she would work as long as she was motivated to do it. And as a result of that, she helped an awful lot of people and made an awful lot of changes or, or opened the door for an awful lot of changes, even though people didn't know that. And see, she never had the need for being the one in the front, making a lot of money, uh, getting a lot of notoriety, or praise for it. That just wasn't a part of um, her whole being. So that also kept her sort of behind the scenes and unknown. Well, um, so Rosita, you talked a, a lot longer than um, you originally, I think, intended. And I want to give our um, audience enough time to ask questions, but I wanted to find out from you. Uh, your time frame, it's already um, 10, 17. In I'll the... stay as, as long as you, you can stay. Okay, all right. Well, um, Elaine, I, uh, uh, Holtz, I know that you had a question first. And yeah. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I mean, Polly Murray has definitely become one of my heroes. And I, I just have two, two questions for you. Uh, the first question is, you know, where where do you think, and in, in doing the research and knowing her as as a as a niece, where do you think she got her tenacity? Because she was very very strong willed. I mean, she was able to do when once she got an idea, she moved forward. And there was a lot of obstacles she had to jump over. I mean, that when I first discovered her, that's what was so inspiring to me how she was able to move forward. And then the second thing I'm just curious about is her relationship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I mean, how, how did that, do you, do you recollect how it started and, and what are some, do you know at least maybe one case that she worked on with her? Um, all right, I'll start with the first um, question. She, um, I, I really believe it started when she was three years old and went to Durham. I think the whole experience of seeing what she considered, she used the word unfair as, oppo as opposed to, you know, uh, if she had been older, uh, she would have probably said uh, discrimination. But she really uh, could see that. She, she had great skills of um, observation and she, um, would tell anyone, you know, even right there with three adults and her, uh, four adults, excuse me, the two aunts and the grandparents, she sat right there at three years old and said, it's not fair that I get one pancake and he gets three. So she, you know, she didn't have a problem with that. And I think, uh, I don't think that she developed that um, in Baltimore, but again, when there are four children or five children or six children, you know, people come up with different kind of coping skills and uh, what have you. But I really think it was being in Durham, and she she her school was three miles uh, from their house, 
And she walked every day to school and every day back because she was not going to get on the back of the bus. She wasn't going to have it. And she started uh, when she was very young. She had a paper route and uh, she did other kinds of uh, um odd jobs and she stayed uh, saved up her money until she could get a bike so that she could ride those three miles to school um and she uh always felt because she was a human being and everybody else was a human being she had the right to be able to express her opinion and her opinion was just as important and even when um, they were on the bus and they were arrested and she actually went to jail, she knew the two of them, she and, and uh, her friend knew that um, if they continued to say the things they said and do the things they were doing, that they would probably be arrested. But she had decided in her mind that she wanted to get arrested because she hoped that that would be a case where the NAACP would support her um, and get, and she wanted to get, her foresight was we can get rid of the uh, Jim Crow laws if uh, the NAACP can win that case. When she tried to get admitted uh, to UNC, they, um, the NAACP refused to take that case was they didn't think she could win. And, um, but, but she thought that she could win on the other case. She also, uh, in Washington, uh, way before the Goldsboro, um, Greensboro uh, sit-ins uh, in the 40s, 43 and 44, she and a gentleman, a student in the NAACP, um, organized sit-ins and they actually uh, got two cafeterias to open up to black people. Um, so she, she just had this, I'm not gonna take no for an answer kind of attitude. And they're, the only way to change things is to try to do it, you know? And so she, she didn't fear um, obstacles. And I think we all benefited um, from that. Uh, the, um, there were some, um, well, first of all, she, was, she worked on uh, equal rights for women, uh, similar to her other work. So one of the, uh, things that she had worked on was equal pay for equal work. And that was uh, one of the areas that um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had uh, was having a case about. She mm -hmm. also worked on uh, a situation in the, in the um, I started saying in the old days, uh, many years ago, um, when a man and a woman would marry, the man was it, like in charge. So women couldn't just go into uh, gross, uh, not grocery stores, department stores, and often, you know, get their own charge cards or buy their own cars or make debt, you know, like buy a home, things like that. There were uh, a resistance to that and a lack of support for funding. And I can uh, remember uh, having a credit card in the 60s that I was my own uh, and I had been working. And when I got married uh, and put my husband and, and notified them that I was married, they gave me the credit card in my husband's name. I had had the credit card for about 10 years, you know, before I was married. So there were th things that happened uh, when I tried to buy my first home, you know, resistance and what have you. So she, 
she had a lot of um, forward thinking about those kinds of things. And she um, spent hours studying laws and trying to find ways that um, the things that she thought were wrong uh, or insufficient could be overturned. Uh, the the uh, difference with Ruth Bader Ginsburg is as a woman, which often happens, she, she felt no threat to not include other women who um, deserve, you know, credit. Whereas the men didn't feel the women were worthy. So that's how uh, she did that. Now, I unfortunately only got to see Ruth Bader Ginsburg talk about Aunt Polly at Howard um, at an all day uh, uh, symposium. I really wanted to introduce myself and um, you know, let her know how much it meant to me that she had come from the Supreme Court to make this uh, presentation. And um, unfortunately, you know, she was like almost surrounded by her security. You couldn't get near her. Uh, so I didn't get the opportunity. It sort of was like the reverse of when I was at the Titus Church. I just wanted to go up and touch her uh, and let her know, um, you know, what I thought about her, but um, I didn't get that opportunity. So Rosita, um, thank you very much. Um, if anyone has a, a question, um, please use the reactions um, symbol on the toolbar, on the Zoom toolbar um, to raise your hand um, or, or put a question into the chat and we'll be monitoring that as well. Um, Elaine Rock, hi. Hi, um, it's an honor to meet you. Um, and I first learned about you through Sonia Pressman Fuentes, who I've interviewed for a book I'm writing. And, um, of, uh, and she was a co-founder of now as well. Um, and I, I wanted to mention that I, I, the movie that the documentary that was, uh, made on, oh, yeah. on, uh, Polly Murray and, and I was really interested because I'm also an Episcopalian. And um, so I, I've just kind of gotten to know her a little bit. And if, if well, I wondered what you thought about that documentary. Um, well, first of all, I thought for two people and the group who didn't have her to talk, talk with. Yeah. Uh, and who had never heard of her, they heard of her through uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg talked to them when they did the year before the Emmy nominated RBG. And uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, mentioned on Polly several times to them. And they said, well, who is this person? You know, we've never heard of this person. And um, she told them who she was. And so after they finished that documentary, they looked her up and decided, mm, I think we need to let people know about it. Now, on Polly's life, just like today, when I was trying to think of what things should I highlight, she, you know, very few people are a, a priest and an attorney and a writer and a poet and a labor organizer and a legal theorist and many other things which she's done well. So it's very hard to take one person and and I guess give uh, the coverage of you know of what you would do and also because she did excel well in quite a few areas you don't want to say just talk about her as a lawyer because she made an impact as a historian and a writer and et cetera et cetera so um I thought considering all the places Aunt Polly had lived, um, all the jobs that she had had, um, 
degrees in, you know, uh, religion and law and uh, liberal arts and what have you, that they had done a good job to try to make, in a sense, some sense of it so that people who didn't know her, didn't know much about her, could get something out of it. Um, I, of course, I sat there, well, the first thing was when the movie started, when the documentary started, I'm sitting there, I'd invited 40 people to, to see the documentary. And my niece had, I think she paid for about 50 people to see it at the Sundance, um, you know, on online through the Sundance Festival. When I heard Aunt Polly's voice and she said, my name is Polly Murray, I, I had an out-of-body experience. I had no concept of you know what I was going to see. I knew that the team had been to the Pauli Murray Center, but um, just to hear her voice, just you know, for about five minutes, I was in another world. And um, I thought that they had addressed, I, you know, I didn't have any criticism of what they included, I guess. But for me personally, I would have seen more, wanted to see more in other areas that they did. And in, you know, they had what, 91 minutes was the documentary. So you can't get it all in, especially in a life like hers. But, you know, I would sit and think, and I've seen it now, I guess about six times. And I think, oh, I wish they had expanded more on that, you know. I wish they hadn't spent so much time on that. But I thought that they had, like I, some of my favorite parts were, um, of course, hearing her voice and seeing her in film. But when the students and, at Brandeis talked about her, uh, it reminded me of the story I was saying about the fact that uh, she was so stuck on, um, Negro with the small N, and then it's given some value by the capital. And then as it, things evolved and it was African-American, and then of course black, she I'm sure never would have called herself black. And um, the students talked about what she brought there and the fact that she created, um, as they called it, the Afro studies program. But then how the students actually became more progressive than the professor because they were from a different time. And so to hear, uh, especially the two gentlemen that talked about her, I'm thinking, mm -hmm, I, re I remember that. I remember that. And I remember the evolution of my mother, um, which again was, was different from Aunt Polly's because she didn't get that uh, deep South kind of uh, uh, experience. And also Aunt Polly was the darkest one in our family. So even though my family chose not to pass, they uh, in many instances were not discriminated. If, not known, were not discriminated against as much as others because people weren't sure what their background was. So there's all that with um, color, the variation of color, um, pe people who are easily identified. When I went to college in New York State, um, one year I was the only black person and one year there were four black people. So when I would go to my physics uh, class or any class, but in physics, our lecture had about 200 students, but then we had smaller groups for the five hour lab. Well, I couldn't be late. I couldn't be absent because a professor could scan the room in 30 seconds, you know, and see that I wasn't there or, you know, <laughs> 
if I were, you know, not sitting alertly or if I didn't raise my hand. So there, you know, there was some of those kinds of things, but I thought considering they spent a year trying to learn who she was and I thought they had done a, a mammoth job in pulling together that. And each time I watch it, of course, I see something else, you know, that I may not have seen sure. before. I would have loved it if it could have been maybe a half an hour longer, but I don't know what they may have put in that half an hour. Right. Yeah. Um, well, it did influence me to uh, look up the Polly Murray Center, and, and I think it's a wonderful website, and it inspired me to write a, a, a piece on her for my, our church newsletter. So uh, anyway, so that's so uh, I, I if, if other members haven't gone there to that website, I highly encourage you to do so. It's quite interesting. It is. That's a one wonderful uh, website. I'm still reading. I mean, they're always updating and adding. And I call Barbara Lau every time, anytime I need to know something that I can't find through research. I, I call to see what has she found, because I consider her the walking Wikipedia of Pauli Murray. But I hope uh, all of you will tap into um, preserving Polly Murray Instagram and preserving Polly Murray um, website and see what I put together. It's very new. I just started uh, my website this year and my goal is to become um, a not-for-profit or, you know, a legal not-for-profit organization um, and that I can uh, create more educational materials for teachers and you know organizations, and that more uh, young people can read about her, learn about her, and hopefully not necessarily become what she was or study even the law, but um, be inspired by her and. Uh, the Pauli Murray Center, and I get also calls from organizations that want to honor her. And there are dozens of, of organizations I know of, so I'm sure there are many, many more that have named their fellowships after her, uh, that have named awards after her, especially in this new climate of uh, social justice needs and equity inclusion and diversity. So it's very heartwarming to me and inspires me every day to um, keep learning about her and, and to keep trying to uh, make her known to those who've never heard of her. So again, um, I thank those of you who were interested in listening and learning and who gave me the honor of being a part of this evening. And I have to always thank Elaine and her enthusiasm for Polly Murray, because when, when uh, we met, I had, you know, worked so hard and there were some doors I couldn't get open. And Elaine just so inspired me, you know, that somebody out there uh, is learning about her and, and inspired by her. So that's helped me to keep pushing. I wanted to just thank you so much. I'm just popping in here uh, because my heart is so full and I thank you for being here and doing such a beautiful, um, it's not a job, it's a passion. Uh, speaking, <laughs> no, about, speaking about your amazing aunt, she was brilliant. From the first time I was introduced to her, she was just brilliant. Um, and of course, thank you, Elaine, because she's been talking about you ever since you all connected. And a big thanks to now, you know, for hosting this amazing event. And I hope it's recorded. I um, want to just venture off a little bit in that your family or some members of your family really seemed very supportive 
of, of Polly, you know, as she traveled when she needed certain things, certain family members, uh, you know, stepped up and, and she was part of the family. And that's so important and so beautiful. I do want to venture into a little bit about that Polly also seems to have been adopted by other communities too, including the gay, lesbian, transgender, XX, non-binary are really saying she belongs to us. We go, hey, you know, like she belongs to all of us, but certainly there's that piece of her that um, I picked up of her uh, love for a, a special woman. And so, the fact that Pauly dressed, I can relate to that, that, you know, she was not a feminine woman. She was yeah. this real, you know, strong, casual, you know, comfortable in her own skin and how she dressed and looked. I, and I, I can just, I don't want to project my thoughts, but I want to hear how, how she walked in the world in how she looked and dressed, uh, how you see that is like another um, challenge that she faced if she had been more effeminate or if she'd been more um, a certain other way. When uh, she was very young, she realized she didn't want the frills and the ruffles and, <laughs> and the feminine kind of clothes. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I, every time I saw her in something with flowers or what have you, to me, it looked so unnatural. It just really mm -hmm. wasn't uh, who she was. Mm -hmm. But she was so lucky. And somehow she knew as a two-year-old and a three-year-old mm -hmm. that Aunt Pauline was where she needed to be. Mm -hmm. Because if she had stayed in Baltimore with, because um, I knew the relatives um, that they mm -hmm. stayed with. They, they stayed with an aunt and an uncle mm. that were brother and sister. Mm. And uh, they would not have allowed that. And I'm not sure they would have allowed her to really be who she was. Mm -hmm. But Aunt Pauline let her buy uh, uh, male clothing or slacks, mm. not dress feminine, as long as when she went to church on Sunday, she had to dress. <laughs> so she could, you know, wear pants the rest of the time and she purchased them for her. And she called her, uh, her sometimes my little boy girl. Oh, wow. Um, wow. So she, she felt free with that. But as she was old enough to, mm -hmm. first of all, leaving the home, you know, where she was surrounded by uh, four adults who, of course, protected her. Mm -hmm. But when when she left home, uh, she realized that if she hit a brick wall because she was a Negro, and if she hit a brick wall because she was female, mm -hmm. it was very important that she not have another major area of her being that was going to keep her from getting a job or, you know, getting an mm -hmm. interview or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. one of the things I'm often asked, you know, things like, what did you learn about her that really surprised you or, or hurt you? As I studied her from a research standpoint, mm -hmm. what I don't think I'll ever get over is the fact that all her life, she could not be her true self. Mm. She could not even share. I mean, there's no one. I, I will always feel that my mother was her favorite sibling. Mm -hmm. Regardless, all of her siblings loved her and she loved them. Mm -hmm. And Aunt Pauline kept them alive in her mind by talking about them all the time. Because due to distance and financial things, uh, she couldn't just uh, be taken back and forth to Baltimore frequently. It, it wasn't possible. And, and the two aunts were both teaching, I think, making $65 a month. And uh, the grandparents were too old. So she really didn't get to see her brothers and sisters 
much, but her Aunt Pauline kept them alive in her mind and also at almost every day of her life talked about her mother and her father and how much they loved her. And so she did have that kind of strong, you know, foundation. Um, but uh, the she died, as I guess most people know, of pancreatic cancer. And at the time she died, I think the the uh, survival rate was about five percent. So uh, she was very ill, but nobody knew, of course, when she would die. Uh, but usually after you were diagnosed and it was, you know, stage four or even maybe stage two, there was little chance that you were going to survive. So the weekend before she actually, before she died, my aunt Mildred, the other, um, my, my mother was alive, but she didn't go. So my aunt Mildred and her daughter, Bonnie, the one I said was legally blind, who's 89, and Bonnie's daughter, the three of them went to Pittsburgh to see Aunt Polly. And they were there the whole uh, weekend. And that was the first time that Aunt Polly shared with them uh, the, the story of the two women that she had uh, truly loved. And, um, and just a little about what it was like to love them, but not to be able to um, show that love, I guess you would say in public, you know, or say, this is my partner or anything like that. Um, if my mother had been there, that, that would have been a no-go conversation. But with the three of them, they were able to talk about it. And uh, I thought it was amazing that uh, that she finally talked about her uh, gender issues and her sexuality um, with them, having no idea. They had no idea that the, when they, I believe, were on the way back to Washington, um, Polly died. So my cousin only shared that with me this year even after the book was, uh, you know, put, written and published. So wow. I never did that. So I can't imagine, you know, holding something about myself in for all of my life and not feeling even comfortable for sharing it with the people I knew truly loved me, you know, and had my back. So that was another area of her life that to me was uh, just so tragic and so sad, but she was a strong, strong person. And I think it was probably liber liberating for her to finally tell her, you know, her mm -hmm. sister. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you so much for sharing those precious jewels about your aunt and that piece of her life, you know, and you're so on the money and, you know, it was, and the timing of that was during her beginning of her transition from this world um, and being able to release that with the, in the family members who were there, who were the ones who were supposed to be there. I think too, because I have a special place in my heart for many types of religions, but the Episcopalians and, you know, Bishop Michael Curry, talks about the Episcopalians a lot and just their openness and their social justice and their activism. Uh, and, um, and so I can see how that was a real comfort to her. Uh, yes. And like you said, she was Episcopalian all her life. You know? uh -huh. All her life. That's something I just learned. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Thank you so There's, much. Uh, you would probably enjoy there was um, one of my favorite shows was On the Road with Charles Carrault, who oh. was, which was a part of CBS. Mm -hmm. And, and a little before she died or before she became very ill in 1985, um, he did a piece on her 
which is on the Episcopalian, uh, in the Episcopalian archives. And I believe I have it on my website Ooh. as well. Um, and that, that was a lovely story because he went back with her to uh, the Chapel of the Cross, uh, which was a church where a white plantation uh, ancestors um, uh, worshiped. And uh, Mrs. Smith um, had, um, of course, given money. And then the uh, lectern had their names on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bible that uh, Aunt Polly used when she was ordained was a Bible that oh. her grandmother had. Oh. And the, when she graduated from Howard, Eleanor Roosevelt had sent, I mean, this like bouquet of flowers like this, <laughs> which were placed on the stage um, during the during the the uh, graduation, mm -hmm. and Aunt Polly had kept the you know it comes with ribbons, mm -hmm. and then you have the little card mm -hmm. that you know said President and Mrs. Roosevelt, and so she had always kept that. So when Charles Carroll was doing uh, this program, and she was um, um, using that Bible that uh, mm -hmm. ancestors had used, mm -hmm. she had the ribbon from that big bouquet from the Roosevelt uh, in the Bible. Oh. And she kept that. And I've been looking to find out if Harvard, I haven't been able to find out where that ribbon is. <laughs> mm -hmm. She kept that all her life. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping it's at Harvard, but I haven't been able to um, locate it. We did just have, and it's on my website as well. Oh. Um, she, I think, had three typewriters during her life. And there's that was one of my most delightful chapters in one of the areas I, I love to talk about, though I didn't mention it today. But um, they called a confrontation by typewriter. So whenever <laughs> she didn't like something, and that's really how mm. she and Mrs. Roosevelt became friends. She just started writing President Roosevelt. You're not doing this. Well, you can do this. You're, you're the, the most powerful man in the world. Right on. Why haven't you stopped lynching? Why haven't you, mm -hmm. you done this? Yes. Why haven't you yes. done that? Mm -hmm. And so she used that typewriter like a weapon. Ooh. Um, uh, we have a um, person from Massachusetts who just donated uh, the typewriter she had from Aunt Polly to the Polly Murray Center. So when I was there for the 10th anniversary, I was able to take pictures of it and it will be uh, permanently on those grounds, you know, when they open it's, it's now, I guess, in plexiglass or acrylic or something. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that uh, was wonderful and so, uh, uh, timely and to think her fingers were always on there and anytime she didn't like something or anytime she wanted to express herself she went to the typewriter right mm -hmm. on. <laughs> to sign her name sounds like a formidable woman for sure <laughs> <Thank you both. laughs> Celeste, if, thank you for your questions yeah, yeah. If, if you met her i don't care who you were you would never forget her. I mean, she was one of a kind. She was one of a kind. And most people don't know what a great sense of humor she had uh -huh. because she seemed so confrontational. Uh -huh. and, I mean, she's told off bishops and all kinds of people. <laughs> you know, if she thinks you're wrong, she was going to tell you so. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Again, Proceed, it's um it's almost 11 o'clock yeah time. and um what i'd love to do is to have you come back at some point you know within the next few months if we can get you a, another date to sure. have you come and, and and because i i know that more people wanted to come tonight and couldn't um the audience that was here thoroughly enjoyed you've got some great comments in the chat i don't know if you've been able to read them but um, 
saying thank you um, and how wonderful the, the presentation was. Thank you for sharing your niece's, your um, aunt's legacy. Um, thank you for sharing a light on her story. Um, she was such an inspiration to us all. The timing couldn't be better for us to learn more about your aunt. We need to hear her stories. And yes, George Floyd catapulted necessary changes in our country. She was brilliant. Thank you so much. That you was know, Celeste. The one, the one thing, the one thing that uh, happened for me on a personal level that you said about that typewriter, I had to write a letter to somebody. I was going to protest something, and I happened to read that she, the, the idea that she used a typewriter as a weapon. And I said, this is for you, Dr. Murray. <laughs> so, you know, because uh, I think that's very important. You know, women need to stand up, use the typewriter, write letters to the editor, write to your Congress people, all kinds mm -hmm. of things you can do with that typewriter. But the most important thing that I get out of reading about her and thinking about her is the fact that she stood up and she, she was not, she wouldn't stop. She, when she believed something was unfair, she moved to change it. And that is the most important lesson I think of Polly Murray, that she, she moved to change things. And what a blessing that she came into this world. And I want to thank you, Rosita, from the bottom of my heart. This was just wonderful. Beautiful. Can I just quickly say, are we, I'm not sure what now is doing um, in contributing to her, um, you know, your, your, um, your, uh, effort and what you're doing, oh, but are we sending some wine to Rosie? She mentioned she enjoyed wine, and we live in Sonoma County. <laughs> we do not get a couple of bottles of wine, take a donation to send to you, so you could enjoy that. I think it's a wonderful idea. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> We'll talk. I gotta go. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Well, I please ask me anytime. I'd love to come back anytime. And like I said, some good things are coming in the future, and mm -hmm. and I hope I can share them with you. And how, how can uh, Rosita? How can people get the book? I mean, I, I need to say one thing about the book. I have trouble with my eyes. You know, I mean, I'm in my. I'm an older woman, and I'm not seen as well. The book is written for young people mm -hmm. and it's written almost like a poem. I mean, I feel like I'm right. I feel like I'm reading a poem and it, 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 it's not a full page. It's just on the side. So it's so easy to read and so enjoyable. And I find that my eyes don't get tired. So I want to <laughs> thank you that I can read so much information. And so, so I would really encourage, how do we, how do people get your book, Rodita? Um, well, I'm, I shouldn't say because so many people seem to be pulling away, but Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, and Indie Books all sell it online. And then uh, many uh, independent booksellers have it. I really don't know. I was I was saying to Amy, gee, I should have checked uh, in Sonoma County who who might carry the book. I could have asked the publisher who might carry the book. But a lot of times, if you ask someone for the, you know, do you carry this? And you tell them what it is or send them to my website, they might be interested uh, in doing that. Or if you know a popular bookstore in your area and you send me the info, I'll send it to the publisher and ask him to try to, you know, push it. But there are a lot of uh, independent stores that uh, do sell it. And uh, next, in November, on her birthday, um, I'm going to be at a place in D.C. called uh, Bus Boys and Poets. And it's actually eight different restaurants. But the owner of the restaurants is very social justice uh, involved and interested. And so he has... Uh, a bookstore within the restaurant and everything is uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, social justice. And um, so, you know, I went there as soon as uh, the book was out to make sure that he knew about the book. 
and that it be carried. And it is. And I'm going to do a present, like I said, a presentation at one of the restaurants um, on her birthday, November 20th. So that's a time. Oh my God, that's what my that was that's my mother's birthday, November oh. twenty November twentieth. Yeah, she was born. Oh November. my God, that's my mother's birthday. 19, it just 19. gave me the chills. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have um, Black History Month coming in February and Women's History Month coming in March. So I celebrate her every day. I'll talk about her every day. But you know, those are some times that. Uh, you know, could be appropriate. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Rosita. It's been a marvelous evening full of wonderful stories about your aunt and um, and just very enlightening for all of us. I think I, I wish we could stay on longer. Um, but well, thank I you for your time. It's been and great. If you, if you can, if you, uh, you could send me what's in the chat or if there are any questions. You know, yes. you see them. Yes, in fact, and I'm going to be saving the. And Elaine, Amy, <laughs> thank you so much. Amy, it's I got one, one quick thing to say. One, one yes. quick thing. Yeah, hi, it's Tina Rogers. Oh, and hi, I'm so, <laughs> hi, everybody. Um, and I want to say thank you so much now, and thank you so much, Rosita and um, and Elaine. But uh, on uh, women's spaces. Um, and uh, I believe it's March 22nd, 2021, Elaine and I um, did an interview uh, for Women's History Month about your auntie, um, Polly Murray. So it's archived and you can check that out. And at Thank the same you. time, yeah, it was also with Beth, uh, Bessie Coleman. So I just wanted to chime in, but I look forward for when you're coming back um, in the future. I will look it up. I've, I've, I've seen quite a few things. I told Elaine I had, I'd read all about God, that. I forgot all about that interview that we did, Bessie Coleman. And, and <laughs> you've Paul done, so, like many, you've yeah. done so many. You just can't <laughs> keep it all in your head. <laughs> so so many amazing women. Yeah. And, you know, and I really appreciate uh, Celeste and her questions and you sharing some stuff. And I will tell you that um, her stuff should be definitely required uh, reading in high schools um, at the minimum. So Let's hopefully we can get that going. That would be wonderful Thank to you. you. Yeah. That's that's my goal. How can we make that happen? All right. Well, Thank I'm going to go you. ahead and stop the recording for now. Okay. So.